Yeah, I don't know how to start this without like being uh, super awkward or like sounding like a game show host. But um, you should just embrace it. <laughs> Welcome, banana. It's outer space. Uh, so Fabian, my good friend. I think, uh, you know, before I get into any questions, I, I just wanted to ask, you know, how you're doing, if you're, like, if you're safe, if everything's okay. I mean, these days, you know, it seems silly to just, like, jump into, like, tell me about the piano stuff without <laughs> kind of, like, the life thing. But how, how are you doing? I'm okay. I, I have a, an ongoing sense of guilt because my wife is from uh, Perth, Australia. And we came out here, there are zero cases of COVID um, in, in the entire state of Western Australia. So uh, there's, there's no need for social distancing or for masks or anything like that. Um, so yeah, every day I just feel very guilty that my friends and family are back in the U.S. Uh, going through all of that. Um, it breaks my freaking heart. But, but I, I, I'm okay. I'm personally okay. <laughs> Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, really happy for you guys to be there. It's, it seems like a cool place to be in general. I mean, like, is so when you say that it's everything's like kind of cool there, people aren't wearing masks, are, are is there like, is there music happening? Like, are people playing music there? Yeah. Yeah. I went to an orchestra concert, the Western Australia Symphony Orchestra. They played Dvorak Symphony Number no. Eight. Uh, the Mozart. Uh, violin concerto in A major, uh, Mendelssohn, and yeah, it's, I mean, I, I will say that they don't, um, in venues like that, they don't uh, sell to full capacity, it's not full capacity, so they will have uh, empty seats between people, but aside from that, aside from those institutions, I mean, you would, you have, you'd have no idea that there was a pandemic going on if you were to just go out in the street. Yeah, that's uh, crazy. Here, uh, I mean, it's funny to like watch, just, even just like watch old movies now and like you see like a crowd of people or yeah. like a party and it just like looks like, I don't know, it, um, it's like watching an old, like, no, <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like watching a zombie movie or something. It's just like, what are you doing? Like there's zombies outside. Yeah. Well, I mean, man, let me, let me tell you for me. So when we were in New York, uh, my wife and I live in Harlem, we left July 1st. Um, so it was the height of COVID in New York, um, and sh she had some uh, health is issues, so she couldn't go outside. So I was the one that was going back and forth, uh, putting some of our stuff in storage uh, for the person that was going to live in our apartment to have their own room. So I, I was in it every day, just that the all of the protests were going on. Um, the firework, you couldn't tell what was fireworks and what was gunshots. Uh, it was just super fun. Um, but anyway, I, I went from that extreme to we flew through Abu Dhabi and then went to quarantine for two weeks here in Perth. And I went from that extreme to stepping outside of, of the quarantine facility into downtown Perth where every, like a thousand people are just walking downtown as if nothing's happening. And I... I had some very serious panic attacks because I couldn't just go from, you know, being on high alert 100% of the time to all of a sudden everything's fine, you can relax. I just, I couldn't let it go. And then the next day we went with the family to the mall and there were children running around everywhere. And I'm like, how can you do this to your children? Um, but yeah, I, it's just, yeah, there, I, I think for most people throughout the globe, uh, they they don't have such a drastic uh, change uh, from one day to the other. It's more of a little by little, you go from complete social distancing to integrating uh, more community things. But yeah, to go from one extreme to the other, yeah, there there was some trauma in there uh, for me. It took about two weeks before I could, you know, relax and and feel like everything's okay. Well, what's the like? What's the sense of friends or colleagues that you have that are also based in New York are, are they like is like pretty much everybody 
out of town now? Or is there like what what sense do you get of of the those folks that were that are kind of like you that that are kind of like um you know lo- like centrally located in in New York? It, the the majority of them have left. Um, I, I feel like people that are from New York that have family in New York have stayed there, but yeah, the majority of people that aren't from New York, uh, they've gone back to where their families are. Um, it took a while for us to do it. Um, we have neighbors that I think like on March 20th or so, they just picked up their things and left for Canada. Like, and, and most of the people, like most of our neighbors that are musicians that we know, most of them just left immediately. You know, a, a lot of them is because uh, they have kids and that they didn't see, you know, to keep a five-year-old just stuck in an apartment like that it didn't make much sense, so they just left. Um, but yeah, I, I really feel for the people that are there. Although, you know, I'm, I'm seeing creative, like people are getting very creative and resourceful. Uh, and if, if there is a silver lining to this whole thing is that there's a much uh, greater sense of empathy, I feel, uh, hopefully. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Well, um, you know, as someone who's made a, a sizable chunk of their income from touring and traveling and playing to crowds, I mean, what is what's the sense now, like moving forward, like what are what are plans to, to play music live for people or to tour? I mean, like, are, what are people kind of talking about? What's the, you don't have to give me specifics, but like, what are kind of like, what are even people kind of like planning for or talking about or hoping for? Uh, it seems like all of the tours, at least, you know, European artists, uh, Asian artists and um, American artists, it seems like everybody keeps planning. It's like, okay, we're going to start touring in January, and then it gets pushed to February, and to March, April, and it just keeps going on and on. And it's just nobody knows. Uh, it's it's all up in the air. Um, and the reason I say Asia, Europe, and uh, North America is be- because here, it's in Australia, it's, it's different. I mean, even... Even in Western Australia versus Victoria, which is where Melbourne is, um, it's it's very different. Uh, I'm playing a gig here next week to to you know open to public with no no limit on audience or anything like that. There's the Perth Jazz Festival, which is happening. Um, so yeah, extreme guilt is what I feel. Um, but I I hope that for the people that are watching uh in in the u.s and in in places where uh there seems to be this uh antagonism of science you know it's just please stop doing that um uh here they they really listened to the scientists they they took all their instructions from the experts and it, it was about a month and a half of complete lockdown and then once they did that they were able to reopen everything um just to give you a sense of, of how strict they were, when we arrived here, uh, we were escorted by police from the airport to an intercontinental, which had been taken over by the government. There were guards sitting outside every single door. Uh, we were not allowed to even open our hotel room for two weeks. If we even thought about stepping outside, it was a $50,000 fine and jail time. Um, so they're not messing around. You can't travel from state to state in Australia. Um, and, but it's, it's working. Uh, the economy in Western Australia is fine. All the businesses are open. You know, it's just, sorry, I know we're supposed to talk about quarter notes and, and diminished quotes <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> like, so my next question um, is how, what are quarter notes? How, how do you feel about, how do they make you feel? I what color flavors here? <laughs> Quav- Do you know what half notes are called in Australia? Half notes? No, I don't. Freaking minims! Isn't that adorable? <laughs> like minims? Yeah. Why? Why? Why is this? I thought I thought music was the international universal language or something. <laughs> yeah. But no. Yeah. But no, it's like uh, most things. It seems like half of it's in Italian, and then the other half is just whatever you want. Like just you yeah. know, pick and choose. 
Um, I don't know why the Italians got uh, got the opera. Got the opera. Oh, it's the opera. That, that's what did it. Yeah. I just made that up, but whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we can pivot from like uh, we can pivot from Armageddon for a second, I guess, <laughs> or or more. <laughs> but um, so you're someone that you know, born in Cuba, grew up in Miami, lived in New York, is now in Australia. Um, what, like, what did the, what have these places meant to you musically and artistically? Like, how, how do you think, I would imagine that like that maybe kind of differentiates you from other artists that are kind of in your generation that you have, that you have some of that besides just like the personal, that you're just a different person and you have really different experiences regardless of where you're from. But, you know, just wondering about that, that journey, um, how it's affected you musically or in your, in your music career. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you say it that way, I guess I have, I have, uh, lived in a bunch of places. Um, I guess I, I, I feel like maybe I have the ability to zoom out and just see people as people rather than tribes. Um, I, I, there's so many similarities between uh, different cultures and yes, I was born in Cuba. I'm, I'm from New York at this point. Uh, but all cultures basically, should, it's just people want to be loved and they, they want to love other people. Um, when I, you know, I have meaningful friendships and a sense of purpose and, and the music just reflects that, uh, and with different aesthetics, it's, um, I, I think it's very important that uh, we are open-minded and we embrace uh, uh, different people from different walks of life and different cultures. Um, so I, I think of music as just pitches, rhythms, timbre, and that's it. I mean, when you know, there there are cultural connections between the places of origin where the music came from, but it is twenty twenty, um, and I. Yeah. Hopefully not yeah. for too much I mean, longer, but yeah, currently it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I, I respect there, there, I guess I feel that music, um, is, is very similar to the art world in that you have museums and you have galleries. Uh, the museum is where you protect, you know, it's almost like conservation of different traditions, cultures, and techniques. And then at the gallery, you have the weirdos like us <laughs> that are, you know, just trying to express ourselves within our time or, you know, how, how, whatever we choose to create. And I, I feel like those two are very symbiotic and, and we need both of them. I gravitate more towards the gallery, but I definitely have an appreciation for museums. Um, yeah. Yeah, we'll get to the the connection to the Natural History Museum in a, in a second. But like, so... This term, you know, do you use the term jazz and how do you use that term and what does it mean to you? You know, is it, is it, um, you know, obviously some people f really see this term as, as something that can, is kind of like an open door. It's available to everybody. It's for everybody. It's by everybody. But other people make, you know, can have made a very compelling case that it, it maybe isn't for everybody or that it, it only certain people should make jazz or only certain kinds of things are jazz. Um, I don't necessarily agree with those arguments, but you know, they have been made by some very smart people um, who are very trying to be very thoughtful or are being very thoughtful. I mean, what's your, what's your take on that? Has it changed over time? I think part of the reason that uh, jazz or black American music uh, appeals to, to people throughout this planet is because it comes from a place of, of uh, pain uh, and joy. Uh, it, it's it's really a reflection of the most sort of visceral human emotions. Um, I never ever forget where this music comes from, um, why it exists, and also the spirit of it is that it uh, it allows for human beings to be themselves. It's a it's an emotional outlet, 
that's what the blues is. Like you got to let it out somehow. Um, I, I, I was on a tour that went through South Africa and I went to the apartheid museum in Johannesburg. And that was a very uh, impactful experience for me. I, uh, if I, I mean, if we ever travel again and you're in Johannesburg, go to the Apartheid Museum. It is, hands down, the best museum I have ever been to in my life. I, I, I think there's going to be like a museum theme here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I learned a lot about Nelson Mandela afterwards, and, and his ideals were, rather than separate people, bring them together. Let's unite. Um, we, are, we are better as a society when we are together. Um, and that, that's the approach that I take in, in life for everything, including music. Uh, you know, I'm Cuban. There are plenty of people that play Cuban music, uh, whichever way they do. And it really doesn't bother me. Uh, I don't, I don't feel very protective about it. Um, there are plenty of people that are keeping the tradition alive in a, in a strict, strict sense. Um, and honestly, I don't know, I, it's, things evolve, things change. Um, as much as I like riding horses, uh, if somebody were to tell me, stop uh, getting in these cars, you now have to ride a horse everywhere you go. I feel like, okay, that's absurd. That's ridiculous. I feel like there's a, a better option here. We can... We can be imaginative and um, consider our reality of the tools that we have with music the, uh, and just in life in general. And let's see how we can make this work. Let, let's see how we can be more sustainable. Um, there's got to be a better way than just ignoring the present, you know. Yeah. I mean, to stay to stay on this um, on this topic a little bit, you know, I. I'm very interested in music education and jazz education at, you know, particularly at the higher education level, like at the higher ed level. And, um, you know, you're somebody who is, re it's really an interesting kind of, uh, an interesting kind of example because you are in some ways a product. I think it could be argued that you're a product of like music school, like conservatory or music school kind of thing, but you're also a product of, like this quote unquote, like the, the, the school of the road. And, um, you did have, you know, I think multiple kind of like formative professional experiences, like while like kind of coinciding or on a parallel track of, of like a, an education thing for you, a kind of like more standardized education. I mean, how do you see all this shaking out? What do you think, like, how did that all work for you personally? And how do you see how do you see kind of like this, this thing working? I mean, to me, the, the jazz education at the higher, at the higher levels in particular is like, is still kind of at this like experimental level. Like, I, I don't know that it really has like a hundred percent proven that it kind of does what it says it's doing or, um, you know, or even is done in the right way, all that kind of stuff. And, but at the same time, there's just not, unless you're a rhythm section player and and is kind of like peaking at a very young age, you might not get an opportunity to learn this stuff on, on the road. The, and I, I will wrap with this question soon, I'm sure. But, but the, you know, the other part of it is like, I, when I think about some of your earlier experiences playing professionally, particularly like when I knew you, I imagine that that was a very high stress situation in terms of like learning how to do that or like starting to do that and and compared to like maybe what we think of as like oh you're going to go out with the bassy band you're playing every night and you're playing like 6 hours a night everyone's like you know people are dancing and all that kind of stuff there's not this kind of like microscope on you like you're playing you know a couple sets a week maybe and you know there is kind of like a a, a a microscope on you. So I guess, you know, you can kind of take that question, if it is a question, kind of where you will, but like, what was your personal experience and and where do you think we go from here, education-wise? Well, 
I like spaghetti. Sometimes I put tomato sauce. In. No, I'm just <laughs> sure. Maybe um, maybe don't take it quite wherever you want, but you know, like okay. it's your time. This is your time. I I think a lot of uh, the responsibility is actually on the quote unquote students. Um, I feel like uh, in the U.S. Th- there's a lot of hand holding um, in in college. And I don't even know if I'll feel like this tomorrow, but that, this is how I feel today. So whatever. Um, I don't know. There's this uh, sense in the U.S. that the student is becoming more a customer rather than uh, a pupil. And that that is strange to me. Um, I feel like teacher, you know, I, I feel it's necessary to, for there to be accountability, especially for bad teachers, Uh racist teachers misogynist teachers all like yeah that needs to to be called out and that needs to change um but but we also have to be able to be honest with students and tell them what you're doing is is uh is in my opinion not good enough uh if if you want to if if you want to have a career in this um, and and you need to do these things, in my opinion, to improve. And and th- as a teacher, I'm telling you, this is what you have to do. I feel like in some institutions now, you can't really do that um, out of a f- out of a fear of being perceived as insensitive to the student's emotional well being. And I, I mean, I don't think I'm a. I, f- I feel pretty harmless, uh, but. I think it's important that we we can be candid with the students and and be direct about what we feel they need to improve on. Um, As far as the difference between a schooling of uh, academia and on the road, they're two very different things. Um, Yes, it was a very stressful uh, time for me, but I will say that in hindsight, I realized that it had nothing to do with music. um, the older I've gotten, I've realized how important it is uh, to have your mental health. Like you have to have your pulse on your mental health, especially if you're a musician or an artist. Um, there's this great book that I read called The Body Keeps the Score. It's by a Dutch psychiatrist. And man, I wish I would have read it uh, a long time ago. I just feel like you really have to know yourself or at least begin on that journey of just endless questions about who am I, what am I doing, how do I feel about these things, uh, am I conscious of, of the things that I'm doing, or are they just kind of muscle memory, uh, how did my childhood impact the way that I conduct myself now, all these things uh, matter not just for you as a human being, but it has a huge impact on, on the type of music that you play uh, and how you perform. Uh, as a musician um, the 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 courage or lack thereof that you have as a composer or an improviser all of that has very little to do with music and a lot to do with who you are as a person um, and yeah I, I just I would encourage people to just let go of whatever stigmas we have about mental health and just embrace learning about yourself it's 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 not going to make things worse. It'll make things better. It, it might make them harder, uh, but in the long run, it makes them it makes them better. Um, yeah. So I and I, so to answer your question, I, I feel like either being on the road or being at school, neither one of those are going to yield uh, positive results if if you're not. I don't want to say at peace with yourself, but if you're not in touch with 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 who you are, what you're about. It's very easy at a young age to compare yourself to other people, uh, even to idolize older musicians that quite frankly are horrible uh, role models <laughs> in my, some of the, some of the older musicians. Um, so yeah, I, I, all my students, I just encourage them to just know yourself, like really spend some time just getting to know who you are and what you want to do, what you're about, all those things. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, I, I've, I've been very, um, 
influenced and inspired by this uh, this book by Carl Rogers, who's um, kind of like the father of the humanistic uh, sort of like um, therapy. And, you know, he talks about having, you know, basically the process of getting your getting to know yourself is is kind of like what what therapy basically is, you know, just kind of like understanding yourself and and a therapist can help you, you know, kind of go through that process. I think if, if in the best case scenario, and I, I, I do think that like a, in some ways, like a really great private instructor can do that in a musical way, you know, not necessarily like yeah. they're not, they're not there to give you kind of emotional therapy. And most of them are yeah. pretty bad at that. And even the ones that kind of pretend to be good at it or want to do it. But, um, yeah. But, you know, in a, in a musical way, it, it's so interesting to me how, like, those two things can be separate, but they can be the same thing. You know, this kind of, like, the personal, emotional thing and, you know, the who you are and then the music because the music is always going to be um, – it's, like, both a reflection of that, but then also it it's kind of also maybe the core of that, too. Like, sometimes you get to the deepest – the deepest parts of you. So I, I think that's really, I think that's really great advice. Well, I'll definitely make sure that we have links to that, that book and all that kind of stuff in the comments if people want to check it out. Um, let's, let's start to talk about some of the, some of the other kind of work you're doing. Um, we mentioned that there was going to be like a through line of like museums through here. So, so you're the founder and the director of Biophilia Records. Um, is that, did I say that right? Is that your official title? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, it's, you know, I think it's, if in some ways it feels like it's only getting started, but in other ways it, it's really established, biophilia has really established itself as, as, um, as a label on the, on the level of pretty much all the other labels that are, that are putting out music right now. And, and, What's what to me is so cool about it is it's not just it doesn't just have uh, you know you're not just putting out really great music um, and and re and um, bringing together some some of the coolest uh, kind of like most diverse most interesting artists that are playing music today but but you have a real mission so so tell me tell us a little bit about Biophilia how it started. Um, I think for a lot of these kind of projects, there's usually like one or two, you know, kind of flashpoints, like where, like where, where the fire really started for you to like, okay, I need to do something. I, I, I have to do this. So what, what was that for you? What, what's biophilia about? Um, well, the, the term biophilia, I, I feel I should define that first. I, I learned of that term reading, uh, E.O. Wilson's books. Uh, he wrote one called Biophilia. Uh, biophilia means an innate love that human beings have towards living things, uh, which explains why, like in New York City, people pay insane amounts of money to live next to Central Park. There's just something about being near nature that makes us feel good. Um, I I've always had that. I didn't realize it was a thing till I read that book, but my whole life I've, I've been attracted to nature. And I, I've, I've also felt very passionate about um, climate change, sustainability, environmentalism. Uh, it, it's, we're, we're going through the sixth max, uh, mass extinction. Ex, wow. We are going through the sixth mass extinction uh, right now. That, I need some vocal coaching there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and that's, very, that's tragic to me. Um, you know, yeah. Uh, needless to say, we we need to take care of of uh, living things on this planet. Uh, and yeah, I've I've always uh, cared deeply about that. Um, I I wondered uh, earlier on in my life if I wanted to go down the path of a biologist or a musician. And at some point, I realized that. Uh, as much as I love science, it was missing this sort of uh, emotional component that I just couldn't live without. Uh, I, I, I need music as an outlet. So, yeah, I was always kind of craving uh, nature and, and science and biology. And it wasn't 
until I, I did a tour through the West Coast where we went through Seattle and San Diego, both of which have incredible zoos that are doing a lot of conservation work. And at the Seattle Zoo, Herbie Hancock was playing a concert. Um, and that was the, the moment where I realized, wait, hold on. These, these two worlds uh, can uh, coexist. There's no reason why they don't have to. Then I started reflecting on my, my own childhood and the fact that I was a Hispanic, uh, I'm a Cuban a male growing up in, in Florida. I felt kind of alienated because I cared about classical music, jazz, and, and nature. It just didn't feel like there were a lot of uh, people quite like me. So originally I wanted to start just some sort of organization that would uh, commission hugs, which are historically underserved groups. Um, but then, as the aforementioned uh, trip happened, I, I went to South Africa, uh, and after learning about Nelson Mandela, I realized that what I wanted to do was to bring people together, so I just I opened it up for everyone. And on the theme of museums, I began going to the Museum of Natural History, where I met uh, Michael J. Foster. Sadly, he's, he's passed away since then, but he really educated me on how environmentalism looks very different from community to community. Uh, for wealthier uh, white people, for lack of a better word, it, it's, it's more like the polar bears and the pandas, that sort of thing. Uh, but lower socioeconomic uh, uh, people, for them, it, it's a lot more impactful and immediate, where there's pollution in their water and the air quality is bad. So. Um, that really helped me see the whole spectrum of uh, environmental injustice that's happening. Alongside all of that, I'm first and foremost a musician, and so many of my peers, including you, are, are great musicians, and I felt like the, the world needed to hear this music. Like we, we need it. We need that medicine that, that you guys are providing. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, uh, I... I put it all together. I tried to create a label from the point of view of the, the musician rather than the music uh, business executives and all that stuff. So I, I really I really try to make sure that the artists get paid a lot sooner than they usually would on other labels. Um, as, as far as the uh, environmental uh, component of it or, or sort of sustainability uh, philosophy, uh, this actually... I. It all kind of came together when uh, the day that David Bowie died. <laughs> I know it sounds weird, but uh, my wife and I, Linda and I had just come back from Australia, and I was completely jet lagged. I remember that day uh, David Bowie died, and I was just in bed for seven hours trying to sleep and couldn't sleep. And that was the moment where a lot of the ideas formulated. At that moment, I realized that I wanted to have something that was not a CD, but it was still a physical project. Project product um, that the consumer that wants a physical thing can still have and also benefit the artist so that they can sell merchandise and not feel bad about the plastic, the, the toll that plastic has on the environment. So uh, out of that came the biofolio, which is a paper origami uh, piece of work. I think I have one somewhere I can show it. So yeah, that's an alternative to the CD. Uh, another thing is that uh, the musicians on the label should volunteer. Uh, we should be proactive in our communities. So pre-COVID, we would go out and volunteer to for tree plantings, for for river cleanups. Um, a few times we would perform for school children for free, uh, things like that. the The last thing that we've done now uh, is we created a commissioning series for. For writers and experts in the field, there's just people in general that are at the forefront of fighting for environmental justice or so social justice, civil rights. Uh, yeah, we commission a different writer every month. Uh, it's called Impacts. And so far we've had uh, somebody from the... We've just had two works. We had somebody from Nairobi uh, and somebody from the West Coast uh, in the Colorado area talking about different... Uh, environmental things that are happening and how they relate to music or just on their own because I, I feel it's such an important I feel like it's such an important topic subject that we need to 
we, we may be musicians and we may, we may be artists, but uh, climate change is something that impacts all of us uh, here in the present and in the future. So, yeah, I, I think it's... I, I can't... I can't imagine my life uh, without uh, fighting to have that conversation, uh, you know, to, to talk about uh, climate change. Um, what are, so what are some of the, like, so musicians, artists that are maybe watching this that aren't part of, you know, the label, what, what are some of the things that they could do right now that would, you know, that would have a positive effect? Um, I mean, some of the things you talked about volunteering, you know, but like, what is it, what does it mean to, to advocate for, for something like this or for, or for this, um, in, in a way that, you know, is authentic. I think it's something you've done really, really well. Like it doesn't feel like it's like a tacked on thing. It doesn't feel like it's, um, that you're doing, that you're kind of like doing this as like a, as just like an angle or something to get more press or to like, or to, you know, to, to make more money or something like that. So like for you, obviously it comes from, it's a very long standing held belief and it's something that you would do kind of regardless. But if you think about it, you know, just like people who need people who need something that's like, I don't know. I, I think people care a lot about this. I, I hope, but me, but they don't really know where to start. It feels very overwhelming to them. Just my, my goal is simple. It's just to get the dialogue going. Let's just talk about it at least. Uh, and, and it's been really fulfilling for me um, going to concerts where it's biophilia artists uh, performing. And we have the biofolios at the merch table. And I've, I've overheard people sitting at the audience talking about the label. And I, one person I overheard say that, you know, I'm... I'm I'm going to try to stop using plastic bags. I'll, I'll try to stop using straws, things like that. And that's great. I mean, I realize that one person not using plastic bags and straws is not going to make that much of a difference. But uh, it, it, there has to be a social movement uh, in order for the politicians to actually change the way that things are done. I, I attended a thing called um, the Climate Reality Conference in L.A., which was hosted by Al Gore. And that's something that he spoke about, you know, as a politician, nothing will change unless the people are urging the politicians to change it. So I am not a scientist, I'm not a politician, I'm a musician, I'm an artist, and I feel like I, I can provide some sort of cultural fuel for a movement to spark uh, so, so, that, so that we have generations of, of young uh, audience uh, young audiences that are listening to music that grow up with a label that yeah has cool music and it's also so natural to also within the same picture have environmentalism and sustainability be a part of it and it, it's not such a foreign thing we it it's it's there <laughs> so yeah I, I just want people to, to talk about it so that there's no sort of negative stereotype about it um i'm I'm really not attacking anyone. I'm not telling anyone they're a bad person. If you want to get vinyl, I'm I'm not telling you not to. Um, I'm just telling you how I feel, what I think, uh, my moral compass. I don't want to have any regrets on my deathbed, and one of them would definitely be having the idea for Biophilia Records and not seeing it through. Um, so yeah, I'm, just talk about it. Just have a conversation. You don't have to even agree, but just talk about it. So I, I found myself um, from time to time wanting to be more uh, outspoken or vocal about something I, I, you know, I'm passionate about or have been thinking about and, and understanding that there are going to be certain people in the audience that kind of like fundamentally disagree with me or, or, yeah, might even get angry, you know, about kind of like what I'm saying. And it always feels so fickle. Like it, it seems so hard to build an audience anyhow. It seems, it seems like tricky to get people to open up, you know, to, to music that is not like, um, you know, that they haven't been hearing on the radio for 40 years. So 
have you ever felt any of that kind of like, has anybody ever expressed this to you? Or have you ever felt any pressure to kind of like, quote unquote, you know, stick to what you know, or, or, or to kind of like, just do what you do and, and not, not, you know, get into these other kind of things? And, and how have you dealt with that? And, and, how, and have you ever felt and were you ever feeling any of those kind of like, nervous pressure feelings about about doing about kind of doing this important work or speaking out no i'll I'll speak about everything um i'm I'm not perfect if if i say something offensive that is offensive i'll apologize but if if i'm just uh speaking my mind and expressing myself as an artist that that's my job you know that's uh yeah, I have had people that have criticized things I've said on the mic stand, um, and I I tell I tell them why I said what I said. Uh, I you know I don't I don't play music to give an audience what it wants. I I give them what they need. <laughs> I don't. Uh, and what I, what I feel they need. Uh, and if they don't like it, that's fine with me. I, I don't have any problems with <clears throat> the music that we play being esoteric. If, if that's what it is, that's what it is. I, I don't know. Life's too short, uh, to not do what, what makes you happy. And, and honestly, that book that I spoke about, uh, The Body Keeps the Score really put things in perspective for me. Oftentimes I'd be, on the train or something and somebody says, yo, fuck you. Like, you know, like, okay. They don't actually say it like that. <laughs> I've never in New York have I been sitting down and somebody said, yo, fuck you. It's never happened. But you know what I mean? Like there are pretty, uh, surreal things that happen in New York where you think someone, it, it's just an evil person and it doesn't make sense. Uh, the body keeps the score. That book really gave me a sense of empathy for, other people, you, you never know what what sort of life somebody has, has lived. And there are a lot of things that people are offended by or they feel very passionate about that might not make any sense to me personally. But if I take into account that I have no idea what their life is like, uh, what I consider from from my point of view like a grave misjudgment, on their part, it's probably it's just the result of some sort of trauma that I am unaware of. Um, and I, I, yeah, I, I'm a part of this huge family that is humanity and I, I don't want, I don't wish anything bad upon anyone. Um, maybe one person. <laughs> um, don't get fired. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you never know what's going through people's minds. I, I try to sort of, I will always say what I think. Uh, I'll, I'll always speak in such a way that, that I am aware of what I'm saying and the repercussions. But if I feel something is wrong, if there's an injustice or anything like that, I think it's important that, that we speak up especially as artists. Uh, I think it's our responsibility. I agree. I have one more question about kind of the music biz, I guess. And, you know, as someone that's now a music executive, a music business executive, I mean, what, what's the, what's the responsible, sensible, fair, equitable, way for this whole thing to shake out in terms of streaming, in terms of the internet, in terms of, you know, playing music live. How does this work? Like how, how do, how do people make a sustainable life making music? It's evolution. Uh, it kind of goes along with that analogy I made earlier to tell audiences not to listen to music for free is ridiculous in my opinion it's like if somebody again like if somebody put a donkey in front of you on a tesla and told you the tesla exists but you are not allowed to use that tesla 
that's not fair. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, and I, I think that's what's happening with, with, uh, people that listen to music. I can't blame them. Uh, the life is hard enough right now. Things are, especially in the U S expensive enough. And if I have a way of listening to music that makes me happy for free, yes, I'm going to do it. Of course. Um, I have no idea what the answer is of, of how things will become more sustainable for the music industry. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I, I know, I know that I love music and uh, I'll continue to have my eyes and ears open for, for any ideas. Uh, I mean, on a more, on a more businessy tip, uh, licensing music is one of the only ways left to, to make a living as a musician, which is, uh, if there, if there are films that, that you like and they like your music to have that to have your music on that film is one of the few ways I think that that you can make a living um, so, so like for you you know making recordings performing live um all of this stuff is licensing is that maybe not the biggest chunk but is that do you feel like that's kind of like a a bigger chunk of the thing compared to some of those other things or no, no, but I'm just saying it, if it were, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's like a 401k. Uh, if you have music in a film or, or TV or something, it's just for the rest of your life. When that gets played, you make a little bit of money. And that's what I mean. Like it's yeah more of a bigger picture thing. Yeah. Now, if you're somebody that has a bunch of, your music and films and TV and stuff, and then yeah, that, that will be your major source of income. Yeah. I mean, and you've, you've played for, you've been a part of recordings and composed for film and, and, um, I guess what, what surprised you about that process is, is there, was there anything that you were just kind of like something happened or, and it was just kind of like, Oh wow. I did not it can imagine. Be pretty gross. Yeah. It can be pretty disgusting. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, there's, a there's this weird sort of thing that's happening now that I guess has been happening for a couple of decades, ever since that iPod came out, uh, it feels like musicians are just kind of an afterthought, uh, in the filmmaking process. Uh, there's so much emphasis on the look and the acting and everything. And then, yeah, the music is the last thing. And. I don't know if it's a lack of music education in schools, but it really feels like uh, there's there's music literacy is just abysmal. <laughs> People don't know the difference between a trumpet and a flute. I don't know. It's uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It, it can be extremely superficial the whole film world. Uh, but I found that the people that are very good at their jobs in the film world. It's just cut through all that bullshit. They don't, they don't, they just love what they do and they want to get better at it. It like, it just feels like the 99% of people underneath that, that's just, it can get pretty disgusting pretty quickly. Um, I guess to, to end on, that's a, my optimistic take on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just to end on like, kind of like a slight, you know, up, uptick. I mean, what, what are you hopeful for these days? I mean, you can just, you don't have to, it could be something simple, but you know, what, what's, what's helping you get up in the morning? The people I love in my life. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah. I love my family. I love my wife. Uh, I love my friends. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very bleak era for humanity right now. <laughs> I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Uh, yeah, uh, but I mean, if there's a silver lining, I think it is that sort of sense of empathy that we all know how much we're, we're suffering through this. And uh, there are people that are suffering way more than, than we are. Um, so, yeah, I, I just, yeah, I hope that we can we can see each each other, each other's reflections when we when we look at each other. There's a lot of uh, political tension in the U.S. right now. Um, 
there's yeah, there's a lot of people that are just so hungry for power that they don't care uh, how much th the majority of society suffers because of of their hunger for that power. Um, I just hope that that people educate themselves uh, and just learn, you know, to just learn facts, you know, not not opinions. You only have an opinion if you know the facts. Um, yeah, I, I champion uh, curiosity. I champion science. I champion the arts. Um, I even champion politics, uh, to, to, to be honest. Uh, that's what separates us from the rest of uh, the living world, our ability to communicate and to have systems of, of civil order and be able to discuss things um, in a civil manner. Yeah, let's just. I think everybody should just learn stuff, <laughs> like, uh, and and not from Facebook. Please get off of Facebook. <laughs> Honestly, it's just it's bad for you. It's not good for you. It's bad for you. Yeah, for real. End the story. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what we're here to do. We're here to we're here to learn and make, make sure to share this everywhere. <laughs> share this everywhere. Not if I'm, <laughs> maybe I'm. Fit. I don't know. I don't. But um, yeah, it means a lot to. To be able to talk to you and I'm I'm so same here. I'm so happy and uh, I feel so so honored that you're taking some time out of your busy they're very busy schedule to hang out and, no but I, and, and, share and some I've of always this with us. I've always wanted to thank you because you were so you encouraged me so much with Biophilia Records at the beginning uh, and and you and you still continue to but there were honestly moments that I thought man I don't know if uh if i could do this and then I, I don't know i don't remember the exact conversation but yeah you were so encouraging about it that i was like yeah maybe maybe this is a thing that I could. and and yeah so thank you you're you're such a nice guy thank <laughs> you <laughs> you really are you deserve all the wonderful things that happen to you oh well yeah they do and they do they keep ha the wonderful yeah. things keep happening to me yeah. i mean well that's all very sweet um I mean, I, I feel the same way about you. Just feel so encouraged by, I don't know. I also think that just ev oh. everything you've done, everything you do is, is such a beacon. You know, I think I, I talk about you all the time to my students and everybody, you know, just as like, just as a, an example that like you can, you can be very successful, be like a super great person and like if you do these things, just you know, and have a unibrow. If, no, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. No, what, I, what? Thank you. What I was gonna say is that um, I don't know if you remember, but we recorded something a long time ago that I wrote. It was for like a woodwind quintet, and you and there were electronics that you you were running it through. It was called Flamboyang. <laughs> I'm rewriting an arrangement of that after like I don't know. 15 years? Uh -huh. No, it hasn't been 15 years. It's been like close, yeah. It's, yeah. it's close. For for big band, uh, I got commissioned to write some music for a big band here in Perth. And yeah, randomly that just popped in my head. And it's just been sitting in a drawer for a while. Yeah. And yeah, I just, I've been hearing your voice in that because <laughs> yeah, cause I remember there was like open sections that you and I just like hooked up and we went in a certain direction and that was very fun and thank you for making music with me oh yeah i loved uh i loved our just like we're just gonna cram in like your tiny bedroom in like the upper west side or whatever and just like make weird noises and yeah. scare all the cats in the building like that was yeah. a that <laughs> highlight a highlight of that time for sure that was super fun yeah. i i miss i, I miss new york in a lot of ways just because of that kind of like Oh yeah, I'm just gonna like I'm gonna like hoof it down 15 blocks, and then we're gonna do something amazing. It just you know, it's a very unique, unique time and place. Yeah, but you know, I find I find that all throughout the world there are little bright lights scattered. That like Perth, Perth is one of the most isolated cities in the world. Um. And and there are people here, you know, they're 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 very aware of how far away they are from like 
New York and Paris and Berlin and all those places. <laughs> but man, there are some incredibly uh, energetic uh, artists and musicians in this town that fight so hard to keep it alive. Um, there aren't that many uh, musicians here, but the ones that are here, like they're like they're warriors. They're keeping it alive here. And I, I'm sure that those people exist all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're one of them. <laughs> I found that to be true. I mean, even just in like, you know, small town Wisconsin, like the there are people there that are like, that are doing the real thing and, um, yeah. and like eat, are eating and sleeping. I, I think that's the interesting thing about just music curves. where it's just like you don't, you don't really need, you almost kind of don't even really need anybody else to be there like you could you could be locked in a cave um and be doing some you know just be really doing the real thing i mean obviously it's like there's nothing that compares to collaborating and being with other people but um but yeah there there are people everywhere doing doing amazing amazing stuff it's weird that we don't hear them you know it's it's weird how and weird and what i mean by weird is just kind of it's a huge problem you know that i think that that I think we all assumed the internet would fix, but the the tricky thing is everything is so saturated now that it we're it's almost worse in some ways where it's just like really just the you know this really small percentage of artists are getting heard. Um, yeah. But there's more music made today than ever. I I think yeah. you know partly because there's more people than ever, but um, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Because it's so saturated, there, there's this sort of feeling of, uh, of fuzziness and warmth when you do find something that you think only you know about. And it's like, oh man, this is my little my little gold nugget here that I this is my music and uh, that that's a special thing. Um, and I remember for a while there, like you were sharing with me the people you were into, and sure enough, as soon as I heard it, I'm like. I'm not going to stop listening to this for a year. <laughs> St. Vincent was definitely one of them. Yeah. Strange Mercy, that album. Yeah. The Dirty yeah. Projectors, too. You hit me to them. Dirty Projectors, yeah. yeah. I was coming at you with, like, the, with, like, kind of, like, the white boy indie rock. Like, I was coming at it pretty hard. I mean, that, I think at, there was that time, too, where I was feeling like, I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if I could be even at, I don't know if I am a jazz musician. I don't know if I could be a jazz musician, you know, in the way that, in the way that I was kind of experiencing it. And so I, I think I was really looking for alternatives and, and just kind of also being like, what, what else, where do I see myself in all of this, you know? And I don't know. I think, I, th I think that's a, I don't know where that question even comes from because it's like, um, why do I need to find other people that are, making the music that I want to make, why can't I just make it? You know what I mean? Like, or, or whatever that kind of thing is. But, um, I, we're all so, so in search of like models, uh, like you were saying, you know, there's role models in life, but also role models in music. Yeah. At a certain point that has to be you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's real. Yeah. Okay, cool. I don't know how this is like, I, yeah, I don't know if this will actually even wrap up. I think I might just like... <laughs>